Happy Wednesday! You're listening to Mama Murdered a Podcast. I'm your host, A.B. And this week on Mama Murdered a Podcast, we'll be covering the case of Summer Wells, a five-year-old little girl who seemingly vanished in the broad daylight in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee, from her own backyard while her mom and her grandma were both within shouting distance of where she went missing from. Her family, friends, and church family are still looking for answers. With this being such a recent case, being that it happened in June of 2021, any and all ears and eyes need to be on this case. And after that, we're all here for one thing and one thing only. Let's get it. Summer Moon Utah Wells was born on February 4th in 2016, which is only 10 days before my own birthday, just a whole lot of years earlier. <laughs> her parents were Candace Bly and Don Wells, and Summer and her family lived in Rogersville, Tennessee, which is in the Beach Creek community located in Hawkins County in Tennessee. The Wells family lived on an 11-acre lot covered in wooded landscape in the Beach Creek community. Their house is super secluded and kind of off the beaten path and off by itself. Lots of hills, trees, and rough terrain to get through throughout the entire 11-acre property. And while there are neighbors around, they're just a lot further away than they are in most other places. Five-year-old Summer Wells had three older brothers, all under the age of 13 at the time that Summer disappeared. I'm choosing not to use Summer's older brother's names because they're all underage. Summer's grandma also lived on the same property as the Wells family in a camper or RV-type trailer that was only about 25 feet from the front door of the Wells family house. So, Grandma actually lives in the same yard that the Wells house sits on, which may seem important a little later on. This property is not a house that you would just wander upon, and you almost have to know where it is in order to find it. The best way to describe the house and the layout of the land is to say that it's basically like a cul-de-sac with no other houses around for quite some time. The driveway wraps all the way around the perimeter of the property, and both the entrance and the exit to the property can be seen from where Summer's grandma lives, and also from the front door to the Wells family house. With this many adults around, I feel like someone probably always had eyes on the kids and probably always knew who was coming and going. Summer was most definitely considered the princess of the family. While she still maintained her status as the boss of the Wells family house, she was also the biggest tomboy. She was completely obsessed with the animated Nickelodeon TV show Paw Patrol, and she also loved the Disney movie Frozen. And she loved to pretend to be the main character of that movie, who is the Ice Princess Elsa. And if I'm being real, if you've seen that movie, then you know that there's no other character that she'd rather be than Elsa from that movie. And I don't even have girls, but all of my nieces would definitely choose Elsa over Anna, and I'm just being real with you. Summer's grandma also lives on the Wells property and also has the same name as her mother, Candace. So for the remainder of this episode, I'll be referring to Summer's mom as Candace and referring to Summer's grandma as just grandma. So it doesn't get too confusing because both Candace and Grandma are a pretty big part of this case and the timeline of events that happened on the day that Summer went missing. Summer's father, Don Wells, worked as a construction worker. He specialized in drywall for a company called Tucker Drywall, which is located in the town of Limestone, Tennessee. And from my understanding, he was kind of a higher up guy on the construction crew where he could just kind of ride around from job to job and make sure that things were getting done on time. And he most likely wouldn't have to check in with the management over and over in the course of a day. He quite possibly could have been at a different job site all five days of the week. From my understanding, Don was a subcontractor for this drywall company. And my husband used to subcontract HVAC work before he started his own HVAC business. So I can explain this one a little better than normal. A subcontractor basically just means that Don was an independent kind of employee. The actual company would bid on the jobs get the jobs, price the jobs, and then give the jobs to Don for a lower price than what they, you know, paid for it originally. Now, most subcontractors that I know of get paid by the job and not by the hour. So, normally the way most subcontractors do things, from what I've experienced, is that they try to do the job correctly the first time and in the most time efficient way possible to be able to get paid faster, hence paid by the job, not the hour. If they were, for some reason, to be called back to a job that they had already finished and gotten paid for, then they would have to go back and fix whatever didn't pass inspection for free on their own time. So, back to Summer. Summer Wells has blonde hair and blue eyes, and she's weighing in at a whopping 40 pounds, standing at about 3 feet tall. And being such a tomboy, Summer could keep up with any of the boys in her area and all three of her older brothers. 
she could play in the mud one minute and be Princess Elsa the next, and that could all happen within the course of the same day, which, let's not lie to ourselves, that's life goals. Don, Candace, and their four kids attended a local church pretty regularly for about two or two and a half years at the point when Summer went missing. At the church, there was a Sunday school teacher by the name of Miss Robin, who Summer absolutely adored. If you listen or watch any of the interviews with Candace and Don, they speak very highly of Miss Robin, and they make it very clear that Summer and Miss Robin had a very special relationship with one another. Summer spent a lot of time outside the Wells family house on a swing that was right outside of her bedroom door. And Summer's bedroom was actually a downstairs basement, which also has an exterior door leading to the outside of the house. And since most basements are relatively big, Summer had one side of the basement with the youngest of her older brothers, and Don and Candace used the other half of the basement as their own bedroom. Now, on the day of June 15th, 2021, there are at least two different versions of events that happened throughout the course of the day that Summer went missing, and they both have pretty extreme differences and a lot of major discrepancies. And I'm going to try my best to give you both accounts of events as we go through. I'll be giving you Summer's mom Candace's recollection of what happened this day, and I'll also be giving you the recollection of a 14-year-old boy named Hunter who was actually with Candace and Summer and Grandma on the day that Summer went missing. Now, 14-year-old Hunter is the son of a frenemy of Candace's, and I'm only using Hunter's name because not only his self, but his mom and his grandma have been pretty vocal and have spoken publicly about the events of the day that Summer went missing. And Allison is Hunter's mom, and she and Candace used to be friends, but when Candace and Allison had a fallen out, Candace still remained close with Allison's kids. So even though the two weren't exactly on the best of terms, Candace would still come by and get Allison's kids and take them to do things with her and her own kids from time to time because that's how being an adult works. You sometimes have to deal with people that you don't really care for, for the sake of your kids. So let's get into the timeline of events that happened on June 15th, 2021. At around 6.30 or 7, Summer's dad, Don, left for work. Summer was in the same bed that he and his wife, Candace, shared together. He tried not to wake either one of them up as he left for work. Don was set to be working at a job site in Jonesboro, Tennessee, which is approximately a 40-minute drive from his house, 110 Ben Creek Hill Road in Hawkins County, Tennessee. Summer's mom, Candace, got up at about 7.30, just shortly after her husband, Don, had already left for work. Candace had plans to take Grandma to the Holston Valley Medical Center, which is a hospital in Kingsport, Tennessee. And they got there at about 8.30 a.m. because Grandma was having problems with one of her knees and wanted a doctor to take a look at it. And it's pretty unclear to me, at least, if Grandma had an appointment at this medical center or if she went in as a walk-in. The plan was for Candace to take five-year-old Summer with her when she took Grandma to the hospital, and the three older boys were going to stay at home alone while Candace, Summer, and Grandma went on their trip to the hospital. Candace said during an interview with Chris Madano of the interview room that she dressed Summer in a swimsuit just because it was something thin that, and she knew it was going to be hot later on that day. Candace had planned to sit in the truck with Summer, and they were going to wait on Grandma to get done at the medical center, But at about 10.30, Candace called her frenemy son, Hunter, the 14-year-old that we talked about earlier. Candace says that she called Hunter to see what he was doing. She explained to them that they were waiting at the hospital for Grandma to get done, and they had just been sitting in the truck watching TikToks on Candace's phone. So now the plan is they're going to ride to Hunter's house and hang out for a little while while they wait on Grandma to get done. Because if it is a hospital and if she was a walk-in... We all know how long hospitals can take sometimes. They're on their own time clock without a doubt. So this seemed like a good way to kill time. Candace also asked Hunter to double check and make sure with his mom, Allison, that she didn't care if they rode over for a little while before she headed over there. Hunter asked his mom. Allison said she didn't mind as long as they weren't there for too long. So Candace and Summer headed over to Hunter's house to kill a little time. Candace and Summer had planned to pick Hunter up and go fishing while they waited on Grandma, But when they actually got to Hunter's house, they were only there for a few minutes when Grandma called at about 11 a.m. and said that she was finally done. Hunter asked if he could ride with them and hang out for a little while. And Candace said to make sure it was fine with his mom that she could drop him off later that day. Hunter checked with his mom, Allison. She gave him the okay, and she just asked that he not stay out too long. After leaving from Hunter's house, Candace, Summer, and Hunter went back to the hospital to pick up Grandma. 
The doctor that Grandma had just seen had sent a prescription over to their local Walgreens pharmacy for her pain management in regards to the knee pain she was having. From the hospital, they all four headed to the Walgreens drive through window to pick up Grandma's prescription, but the pharmacy told them it was going to be about 30 or 35 minutes before the prescription would be ready to be picked up. And that's a hell of a shorter wait time than CVS. That's just me from a personal experience. Now, Hunter says that while they're sitting in the Walgreens drive through line that Candace got a phone call from Don and that Don was calling to let Candace know about a man that was on their property. But this mystery man had been there for over a week and that he was watching the kids and creeping them out. He says that he knows what was said because he asked Candace why Don was calling. But Candace and Don both say that this is untrue and they've never entertained this as fact. I also feel like that's not something that you would forget, that there's a strange man that you don't know on your property where you have four kids. So, instead of sitting in the Walgreens parking lot in the hot truck, they decided to drive to a smoke shop where Candace bought three Twisted Teas, which are pre-mixed alcoholic drinks in a can. She also bought a pack of cigarettes and a few Skittles-flavored nicotine vapes. From the smoke shop, they decided to ride to a small swimming hole and let Summer swim for a few minutes to kill time while they waited on Grandma's prescription to be ready to be picked up. While everybody was hanging out at the swimming hole, Grandma stayed in the truck for a few minutes by herself after they got there to add minutes to her cell phone. And during this swimming trip, Candace took a TikTok video of Summer playing in the water. You can find this video on TikTok if you look for Candace's verified TikTok. It has been verified to be her account. It's just a video of Summer playing in the water, splashing. Candace pans the camera around. You can see Hunter throwing up gang signs, and then she pans around to a flower, and the video stops. Once Grandma got done adding minutes to her phone, she got out of the truck to watch Summer swim. While Summer splashed and they watched her play, Candace and Grandma were looking at different wildflowers that Grandma had seen on their last visit. Grandma really wanted to pick these flowers and take them home and transplant them, but she didn't want to get in trouble for picking flowers at a state park, so Grandma looked, but she didn't touch. From one of the first interviews with Candace and Don, Candace says that they were all three only at the swimming hole for about 20 minutes. Hunter says that Candace gave him one of the twisted teas that she had gotten from the store and that they sat and shared the vapes together. From the swimming hole, they went to another smoke shop called the Hippie House, and the Hippie House had just opened, and Candace and Grandma wanted to go in and check out the new store. They left Summer sitting in the truck with Hunter while they went in. They only stayed in the store for about 5 to 10 minutes or so before they headed back outside and got in the truck. At the hippie house, Candace bought two more nicotine vapes. She kept one for herself, and she gave the other one to Hunter. So after leaving the hippie house, they headed back to their local Walgreens on the corner of Happy and Healthy to pick up Grandma's prescription. After they got the prescription, Candace stopped at a Sonic fast food chain that was right across the street from the Walgreens to get everyone drinks and slushies. From Sonic... Candace stopped at a local grocery store called Priceless, where she went inside to grab a few things like milk, cheese, and bread. Candace says that she was only in Priceless for about five minutes, which is the quickest grocery trip I've ever seen. I don't even think you could grab a pack of gum and check out in just five minutes at any grocery store. And I also live in the middle of nowhere. Candace says that she was the only one that went into the grocery store and that she was only in there for about five minutes, but Hunter says differently once again. Hunter claims that both Candace and Grandma went into the grocery store together and that they were in there for about an hour. So there's another big difference as far as the timeline of events leading up to Summer's disappearance goes. He says that him and Summer just sat in the back of the truck and watched TikToks on his phone. After she got her few things from the grocery store, she threw the bags of groceries in the bed of the truck and sat the milk jugs in the back seat where Summer and Hunter were. Candace takes Hunter back to his house to drop him off and when Hunter gets out of the car to go inside of his house, he sat the jugs of milk that Candace had just bought in the seat beside of where Summer was sitting in the back seat of Grandma's truck. On the drive home from dropping Hunter off and going back to their own house, Candace happened to glance into the back seat to see that Summer was sleeping with her arms over her head in the same way that Candace says that Don sleeps all the time. Candace said that she thought this was adorable, and she asked Grandma if she would get her phone and snap a picture of the way Summer was sleeping so that she could show Don later on that day when he got home from work. But instead of a picture, Grandma mistakenly took a short video of the way Summer was sleeping instead of just snapping a picture, and that video was only a few seconds long, and it was taken at 3.09 p.m. And in that video, you can hear Candace ask Grandma, is Summer still sleeping with her hands over her head? 
And when Grandma says no, that her arms are back down, you can hear Candace in the background say something along the lines of like, dang it, that's what I was wanting to get on camera. There's a lot of speculation about this video of Summer sleeping on these milk jugs. People have gone so far as to say that they think Summer may have already been dead when it was taken, and maybe that this video was only taken to show police later, maybe like some twisted way to show proof of life, but in my own opinion, I just don't see that being the truth in this case, and there are a few reasons I believe that, which I won't get into because literally no one cares. After Candace, Grandma, and Summer get back home, Candace woke Summer up and went inside with the three older boys and asked them to go grab the groceries that she had picked up out of the back of the truck. But this has always been weird for me to try to process, too. If she only went into the grocery store to get one or two things, then why does she need to help carry them one or two bags into the house? And how many of those groceries could have been Grandma's? And why lie about the things that you bought? It doesn't seem important. Not important enough to lie about. A few of the groceries were Grandma, so Candace goes through and gets her things out and puts Grandma's stuff to the side, and once Candace puts her things away, she walks to Grandma's camper or RV-type trailer to drop off the groceries, and while Candace was over there dropping off the groceries, Grandma brought up the fact that she had some flowers and cactuses that she needed transplanted into bigger flower pots. Candace said that she would help Grandma and that she would go back and see if Summer wanted to help plant flowers too. Of course, Summer jumped to help her mom and grandma plant flowers, and I'm still not sure if they were transplanting smaller flower pots into bigger pots, or if they were transplanting something from a pot into the dirt. But either way, after Summer, Candace, and Grandma got done with the flowers, they went inside Grandma's trailer and washed their hands, and of course, Grandma asked Summer if she wanted a piece of candy, because what grandma do you know that doesn't always have a butterscotch candy? Summer got the candy from her grandma and told Candace that she was ready to go back inside of her house, where all three of her older brothers were still at, that she wanted to go play with them. Candace says that she walked Summer back to the door and let Summer inside. Candace also said that she yelled inside at the three older boys and told them to keep an eye on their sister while she helped Grandma fix her knee brace. Candace says after she walked Summer to the door of their house, she went back to help Grandma with her knee brace and that she was only over there at Grandma's helping with the knee brace for about two to five minutes before she walked back inside of her own house. So Candace helps finish with Grandma's knee brace. She goes back inside of her own house, and when she gets inside, she sees her three older boys sitting in the living room watching TV, but she doesn't see Summer anywhere. When Candace asked the three older boys where Summer was, they told her that Summer had went to her bedroom to play, which, remember, Summer's bedroom is actually the basement, which she and Candace and Don all share. But Candace says when she went down to the basement where Summer was supposed to be, she wasn't there. Candace said that Summer would sometimes use the external door that led outside to go to the swing that she loved to swing on. So that's where Candace went next. Because remember, Summer's bedroom is a basement with a door leading to the outside. But when Candace got outside, she still didn't see Summer, so she starts yelling, looking around, you know, inside, outside the house. And five-year-old Summer Wells has never been seen again by anyone. And I've seen a lot of people scrutinizing the fact that Candace was only in the grocery store for five minutes, and she was only helping Grandma with her knee brace for five minutes. And I will say this in Candace's defense. As a Southerner, when I say five minutes, that doesn't actually mean a literal five minutes. Most of the time when someone that's been born and raised in the South says something like, well, it only took me five minutes, or come on, it won't take long, five minutes at the most, that normally just means that it won't take very long. You know, I tell my kids all the time, just give me five minutes, and they know that means more like 15 or 20 minutes. It's a term used to indicate that whatever we're talking about didn't take very long. That being said, though, Don and Candace weren't originally from the South, so I've also taken that as a, a note to keep in the back of my brain. Candace can't find Summer anywhere. Naturally, she panics. She calls her husband Don while he's at work and tells him that she can't find Summer anywhere. Don tells her to hang up immediately and to call 911 and report Summer missing. Candace and Don both said over and over again that Summer was not the type of kid that would just take off. She always played outside, but she always stayed close by. Candace calls 911 as soon as she hangs up with Don, but at the same time, Don called 911 while he was on his way home to help search for his daughter. 
The 911 calls have not been released to the public, but parts of the police scanner from the dispatcher to the officer being dispatched to the Wells house has been. And the dispatch scanner log states that the residence will be the first one to the officer's right once he gets to Ben Hill Road. And the 911 call was in reference to a four-year-old girl whose mom came back from a walk and her daughter was missing. It also says that Summer's been missing for about 10 minutes at the time that the officer was being dispatched. So, a few things here. Summer was five at the time of her disappearance, not four. And also, Candace later tells an interviewer without being prompted that she's never gone on walks or runs in that area before because she knows the dangers of wildlife, bears, snakes, coyotes, etc. And I've always kind of wondered if maybe the dispatcher misunderstood things when Candace told her that she had walked home from her grandma's house after helping her with a knee brace. And without the dispatcher knowing that grandma actually only lives about 25 feet away on the same property, that maybe the dispatcher just assumed that Candace had to walk further than what she actually had to walk in order to get home from grandma's house. Which I'm wondering if that's where the she came back from a walk thing comes in. Because even as a trained dispatcher, if you get a call and someone says, hey, I was at my mom's house, I was helping her put her knee brace on, I've only been gone five minutes, when I walked back to my house, you know, my five-year-old daughter was gone and we haven't been able to find her, that could easily be misinterpreted like your mom might live in the same neighborhood as you or live close enough by to be able to walk, but I highly doubt that their first assumption would be that your mom lives in a camper in your front yard. I just don't think that would be the first thing that you would assume. I, I could just, I could see how easily that could be misinterpreted. But despite those small discrepancies or whatever misinterpretation happened, Don Wells claims that he arrived home from work to help look for Summer and that he beat the police officers to his house, which I find that a little odd just for the simple fact that police were dispatched to the Wells house immediately after the 911 call was placed because, well, because it's a missing kid. And Don was working about 40 minutes away from his house that day. I actually looked it up, and in a car going the speed limit with no traffic, it would be a 39-minute drive. Now, I'm sure he was speeding to get home, but it was also 6.30, and that's also when everybody else is on their way home from work as well. So, how does he make it there before the police were able to? That part never really made any sense as far as the timeline goes. That's not the only strike for Don, though. Don has also made a few comments later on in the investigation that people really did not like. Don said that when he pulled up, he saw all three of his older sons in the yard and saw a few of the nearby neighbors out yelling Summer's name, and that's when he knew she was gone. He knew that somebody had taken her. He has said that from the minute he realized that she was actually gone, that he knew someone took her. People also didn't like the way that Don used past tense or present tense when he talked about summer, and that, I mean, I speak the same way. My kids are alive and well, sitting in a classroom right now, and I will still find myself using past tense when talking about them. For example, during an interview, Don said that summer's favorite song used to be Godzilla, and people jumped all over him for the way that he used used to. But I feel two different ways about this. For one, like I said, everybody I know talks like this, and maybe it's just a Southern thing. And for two, fathers have intuitions too, and maybe he feels in his heart that she's gone. He just doesn't have the heart to speak it out loud and into existence. And as far as the three older brothers go, their statements have not been released to the public, my guess would be because they're minors. But as far as the public is aware, the boys' statements have never differed from what Don and Candace say happened on that day. There's a lot of people that wonder, did the boy see Summer come in when she was supposed to go in and play with him? Or did she never come back when Candace and Grandma got home from their day trip? And if there have been any differences in the three older boys' statements and what Don and Candace say, the police and the TBI have not made that public knowledge. Which says a lot to me because have you ever tried to get your kid to lie to the waitress or the hostess at a buffet to get your food cheaper? They will rat you out so freaking fast. So the 911 call was placed at about 6.30 that evening. So that only left a few hours of daylight when they were able to search. But in those few hours, they were able to gather upwards of 60 people to help look for summer. So in such a short amount of time, we now have officers and 60 plus volunteers out in the woods looking for summer. Their thinking was probably that she couldn't have gotten far on her own 
especially not on foot, being barefoot and scared of snakes and bears and coyotes in the woods because she had grown up in the area and she did know the dangers of the wildlife that lived in the woods surrounding her house. There were a lot of search efforts in the next few days after Summer went missing, and it involved more than 120 teams, all out searching at one time. The Hawkins County Sheriff's Office, surrounding families in the Beach Creek area, and the Churchill Rescue Squad were all out searching on foot. The searches were time-consuming just for the simple fact that they were searching every square inch of this rugged terrain and thick wooded acreage. It was said that searchers were told to search everywhere and that they were essentially looking for a child small enough that they could hide in a place where only a sheet of standard printer paper would be able to fit. There was a huge ground search led by more than 100 searches conducted by local, state, and federal agencies. Volunteers were out searching on foot, scent tracking dogs were brought in, helicopters were flying overhead, and all of them were searching for summer. Scent dogs did pick up on summer scent from the basement door, which is commonly referred to as the back door, and across a section of the wraparound driveway, down into the woods, and the scent was no longer able to be tracked once the dogs got to the point where the woods and Ben Hill Road meet. This is typical in a case where someone is led away and forced into a car. The scent usually stops pretty abruptly like it did in Summer's case. Also, Summer did live there, and she played in that yard and the driveway often, so of course her scent would be there. And to fully understand how Summer could be taken from her own back door and not seen by anyone on the property, here's a short description and layout of the outside of the house. The driveway goes all the way around the entire perimeter of the house. Summer's back door slash basement door is at the bottom of a slope, and Grandma's camper is at a much higher point on the property, and that back door slash basement door cannot be seen from Grandma's camper. I will try to post a bird's eye view of the property with an indicator of where the scent started and stopped on social media platforms, which will be linked in the show notes below. And if you look this address up yourself online, Google Maps gets pretty close to the actual property where the Wells family lives, but it's not an actual exact red pin of where the house is. Which, I get this because Google Maps always, always, always automatically changes my street address to the the next road over from mine. And we have the same street number, but Google Maps sends all of my Amazon packages to the sweet little elderly lady that lives on the next street over from me. Luckily, she's nice enough to call me and tell me that I have Amazon packages at her house, which saves me a lot of explaining to my husband. Miss Robin, who was Summer's Sunday school teacher, says that she received multiple FaceTime calls from Candace and that she wasn't able to answer them because she was taking pictures for her own daughter's dance recital. But when she was done and she heard the news, she immediately dropped her own daughter off at home with her husband and she packed a bag with flashlights, snacks, and extra batteries and she was at the end of the driveway leading up to the Wells house by about 9 or 9.30 that evening. And by the time that Miss Robbins got to the end of the driveway, the police had already had the driveway blocked off so that no one else was able to go on or off of the property. There were already helicopters and tons of other agencies already there searching. And it wasn't until she pulled up to the end of the driveway that she realized that this wasn't just a case of, I don't know where my kid is right this second. She knew that this was serious and that Summer had been gone with no trace of her for this many agencies to be there and responding that quickly. Miss Robbins tells Chris McDonough during an interview that she did for the YouTube channel, The Interview Room, that while she was standing at the bottom of the driveway trying to figure out how she could help, she asked some of the officers if they had a picture of Summer, you know, to see if they even knew who they were looking for. And a few of the officers had seen a picture of Summer, but some of them hadn't. And I bring up the picture to be able to bring up the haircut that we've all heard so much ranting and raving over. Summer had always had shoulder-length, beautiful blonde hair, And sometime before Mother's Day, Summer's head was cut to a very short buzz cut. And Don claims that Summer tried to cut her own hair and that they tried to fix it with a shorter haircut, but that it just got out of control. So they decided just to shave her head and she would just have a super short buzz cut hair like her brother's until it grew back out. Candace and Don also say that Candace shaved her own head so that Summer didn't feel so alone, especially being the only girl out of the three boys in the house. So, since they all had shaved summer heads, that Candace and Summer would be twinsies for the summer. But the way Candace says it happened was that Summer wanted her hair cut short and buzzed off, like her brothers and herself, 
because according to Candace, she had recently shaved her own hair super short since it was so hot outside, and Summer just wanted to be like her mama and her brothers. And when the Sunday school teacher, Miss Robbins, asked Candace about why she had cut Summer's hair the next Sunday that she saw the Wells family at church, Candace just told her that they had all decided to get cool Summer cuts. And according to the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, or the TBI, Summer was last seen by Candace at approximately 6.30 p.m. She was last seen possibly barefoot, wearing a pink shirt and gray sweatpants. Even though earlier reports, it was said that Summer was last seen in a pink shirt and gray shorts, not sweatpants, still possibly barefoot. The TBI put out an endangered child alert sometime after midnight on June 16, 2021. And only a few hours later, the endangered child alert was updated and changed to a statewide Amber Alert. And each state kind of just adopts parts and pieces of the Amber Alert system to use as their own, which is why the criteria in each state varies in some way or another. And according to the TBI in Tennessee, for an Amber Alert to be sent out, it means that, quote, the person is 17 years of age or younger, the child is in immediate danger of bodily injury or death, and there is a description of the child, abductor, or vehicle, end quote. But it's been more than a year, and there's still no sign of what could have happened to Summer Wells. The TBI spokeswoman, Leslie Earhart, spoke publicly about the case the day after Summer went missing on June 16, 2021. The TBI said that they had recovered all the cell phone data, that they were getting the approval and planning on executing some search warrants, and that all relative social media accounts were being looked into. And the press conferences continued like this for weeks, with little to no leads. By Wednesday, the TBI had brought in 106 agencies to help search from surrounding states like North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Ohio, Virginia, and a few more. And the Churchill rescue captain, Tim Coop, was quoted saying, quote, I've been telling these searchers the past several days, when you're looking through this property, you're not looking for an adult laying there. You're looking for a five-year-old girl that weighs approximately 40 pounds. Someone that size could wad up and hide in an area the size of a legal pad or a folded laptop, end quote. And even after using FLIR thermal heat image searching, and according to the FLIR.com website, the FLIR thermal image searching is described as, quote, a thermal camera that detects heat, radiation, and can be used to identify the surface temperature of objects and people. The FLIR camera searches are basically used to detect the differences in skin surface temperatures and pattern changes. So all that to say that if there was a temperature scene that was high enough to be a human body that were caught on those FLIR cameras, we would know about it by now. But when the public was asked if anyone saw anything suspicious or out of the realm of what they would consider normal on the day that Summer was last seen, or the days leading up to her disappearance, or even anything in the following days, there was a media frenzy about someone driving a 1998-2000 to 2000 model red or maroon-colored Toyota Tacoma that was seen in the area on the day that Summer was reported missing. The driver of this vehicle is not considered a suspect in this case, but the police do hope that the driver would come forward, and they hoped that he would come forward in hopes that they, maybe they had seen something that they didn't even realize that they saw, maybe something that could be useful to the investigation. In one of the first interviews that Don Wells spoke publicly about his daughter being missing in, he was almost certain that Summer would never wander off and that someone would have had to have taken her off of their property, which rubbed a lot of people the wrong way. And the way I see this is that Don has never spoken publicly before this, and that he also knows his daughter and may have a dad's intuition. Don and Candace are not very highly educated people, and I'm not saying that to be rude or judgy. I'm saying that as somebody who comes from the sticks, and I'm also not very highly educated myself. I would have no idea what words to use or how to properly word it to where it would make sense for the rest of the more educated public to decipher. After the news of Summer spread and more people started doing more interviews with the Wells family and with the people closest to them, Hunter tells Chris McDonough from the interview room that on the day that Summer went missing while they were all out the swimming hole, that Summer had went underwater and he had to jump in after her. But he says that she was only underwater for about four to five seconds before she came back up on her own. She wasn't coughing up water or choking, that she seemed fine. Candace claims that she didn't go underwater and that she was watching her, and when people saw this interview with Hunter, it brought up a memory that somebody that met Candace one time had, and she was ready to tell it. 
So there was a co-worker of Candace's frenemy, Allison. Allison's Hunter's mom. Allison and Candace used to be friends. They are frenemies now. So Allison and a co-worker, they did an interview with Chris Madonu, and they told Chris about one day when they were all grilling and hanging out, the kids were all playing in the pool, and that when Candace's older son started roughhousing with each other, that Candace made the boys get out of the water and lay flat on their stomachs on a blacktop pavement, which is extremely dangerous if it was as hot as it gets on a normal summer Tennessee day, and the kids were wet, they could have been seriously burned, especially since they were wet. This goes to show that Candace has an unusual way of disciplining her kids, which is also a good time to point out the fact that on the day Summer went missing, Candace had left all three of her older sons home alone for the most part of the day, and the oldest one was only about 12 at the time. They were left there for about eight hours. 12 years old is not old enough to be in charge and be responsible for two other kids, so this has to be some sort of sign of abuse, some sort of sign of neglect. I mean, sometimes you just have to take things at, at face value, and this, it is what it is. Something else that seems to be completely different about Hunter and Candace's recollection of the timeline of events that they recalled about the day that Summer went missing is that Candace herself said that she had dressed Summer in a bathing suit that morning before they took Grandma to the medical plaza, and Hunter says that Candace changed Summer into her bathing suit at his house when she picked him up that morning. And that Candace put Summer a uh, tank top and a pair of shorts on over her bathing suit. And again, why lie about this? It seems silly. Something else that just seems odd is the things that have come out about this case and this family since the day that Summer went missing. For example, Candace sent a text message to a friend telling this friend that Don had actually been home from work earlier than they had originally said and asked her not to say anything. A few other things, and I swear I'll stop after this, but here's yet another story that has two sides to it. When Hunter was asked about Summer's older brother, he claims that Candace had said that the boys had actually gone to work with Don that day. But naturally, Candace says this is not true. I just don't see a reason for this kid to lie, but we'll continue. Going back a little bit to the swimming hole the day that Summer went missing... Hunter says that Candace gave him the Twisted Tees that she had bought and that they shared the vapes together while they sat and watched Summer splash and play in the water. Candace said that she would never give a 14-year-old alcohol and that she bought those Twisted Tees for Grandma. And that the only thing that Hunter had to drink that day while he was with them was a Mountain Dew and a Blue Slushie from Sonic. But I'd be willing to bet if Candace would leave her 12-year-old son in charge of his two younger brothers for upwards of eight hours, that she would probably give a 14-year-old alcohol. It just doesn't seem that far-fetched. I think it's important to kind of go through some of Candace and Don's background before they met and had their own four kids together to kind of better understand them as parents. Don Wells is quite a few years older than Candace, and both Don and Candace had been married to other people before they met each other and had their four kids together. Candace had previously been married to a man named Andrew, and she and Andrew had two children together. This is where it gets tricky because they did that thing again where they named their kids after their self. So they had one son and one daughter whose names were also Candace and Andrew. But Candace Sr. and Andrew Sr. had a pretty volatile relationship with one another, and there were enough claims of abuse between Candace Sr. and Andrew Sr., that both of their children ended up being removed from their care and they became a ward of the state. And I found a post on Facebook made by Candace Sr.'s oldest daughter that was taken away from her. And she said, quote, I was adopted at six months, put back into foster care around the age of 12 with my brother, same name as my bio dad. I was told that my bio mom was a meth head and abused us as babies. She has a record, not sure if she has one where she is now, Tennessee, but she has one or a few in Wisconsin for sure, end quote. So, let's talk about Don. Don has a record too, and Don's record gives me a little bit of a nauseous feeling in the pit of my stomach, or at least this part does. Don was accused of sexually molesting his stepsisters, Mary and Jeannie, when they were younger. Jeannie even claims that she called the TBI to let them know exactly what Don had done to her when she was just five years old. She made that call as soon as she heard about what happened to Summer. 
So this accused case of molestation happened over 30 years ago, and typically nobody tries to drag things from that far in somebody's past to throw up in their face 30 plus years later, but Don's kind of admitted this, or at least tried to defend his actions. There's a phone call with Don and his stepsister Mary, where Don's saying that he was only 12 and that Jeannie, quote, came on to him. How does a five-year-old come on to anyone? That's the million-dollar question that I would love somebody to be able to answer. This abuse continued for years until Don was 18 and Jeannie was 12. During that same phone call with Mary, Don says that Jeannie was throwing him under the bus and that she wasn't taking responsibility for her part that she played in the situation. He's blaming Jeannie, who was five at the time. Don even says that Jeannie tried to sleep with his dad, too. She was five. Don called this playing house when he talks about it and then it goes even further and he says that Jeannie was the one that stuck her hands down his pants first so I guess that makes him feel better about himself so let that sink in while I finish this part by saying that there are a total of seven different women from Don's past whether they're family friends or friends of Don's stepsisters that are all going to court right now to try to get charges pressed on Don for those sexual molestation claims from when he was, quote, a kid, because that's what he keeps saying during that phone call. Well, I was just a kid too, Mary. Okay, but you were 12, you know right from wrong. Also, I just realized that Don was actually 19 and Jeannie was 12 when the abuse stopped, but all of those seven women from Don's past were from when he was younger. On October 14th, 2021, Don Wells came home from work and he was drunk. And Don believed that Candace had another man inside their house and that she was cheating on him with this man and Candace had to file an order of protection against Don claiming that he drinks and throws things. The report also says that Candace is, quote, afraid of being hurt and that Don is, quote, abusive physically and mentally towards her and that she's afraid for her safety and for her kids' safety. Candace's mom, who I've just been calling grandma throughout this episode, says that she fears Don's going to hurt her as well. Later, Candace ended up dropping this protective order, and Don came out publicly to say that Candace apologized to him and even spoke to the judge to have the protection order dropped. Don Wells did a few hour-long interview with Chris Madonna from the interview room on YouTube, and during the interview, Don spoke openly with Chris and said that the case that happened on October 14th, 2021, when Candace filed the protective order on Don, he says that he had actually been the one that cheated on Candace and that he was going out of town when he got home. And there was another guy at their house, but the guy was actually gay, so I'm not sure how, why or how that even caused an argument. But when Don speaks publicly about this report that was filed and then later dropped on him, he tells the reporter that Candace had apologized to him and that they were working through it which I find incredibly confusing since Don was the one of the two that had done the cheating, which may become an important factor about how easily they both manipulate a situation to fit their narrative later on as this case progresses. I'm only speculating. During the interview that he did with Chris Madonna, Don openly admitted to having a drug addiction and a problem with alcohol, that he had been working on his relationship with God and working on himself, and that no one's perfect and that he's trying to deal with his demons. Don was also charged with attempted aggravated assault, interfering with a public servant, forgery, burglary of a dueling, and theft in a state. In Arkansas, Don was charged with possession of a controlled counterfeit substance without a prescription and burglary between 2006 and 2007. Candace and Don went on the Dr. Phil show, and the show aired on June 4th, 2022. Dr. Phil did say that both parents took a polygraph. I would assume the team at Dr. Phil gave them the polygraphs because, from my knowledge, Don and Candace took the polygraphs, but I don't think either one of their test results were made public. Also on the Dr. Phil show were two out of the four guys from the YouTube channel, the Behavior Panel, and they're trained body language experts from a team also known as the Human Lie Detector Test. Greg Hartley and Scott Ruse, and when Scott and Greg sat down with Candace, they ask a variety of different questions, and one in particular made Candace so upset that she actually got up and left the interview altogether. Don and Candace were asked if they knew what the Cornbread Mafia was, and if they thought that the Cornbread Mafia could have something to do with Summer's disappearance. Candace got visibly upset and eventually just walked out of the interview altogether. 
Later, when Dr. Phil confronts her about why she got up and left and what she's hiding, she claims that she doesn't know anything about the Cornbread Mafia and that she doesn't know what happened to her daughter. And I do want to throw in the fact that both Scott and Greg from the behavioral panel said that they did not see any signs that Don was holding on to any guilt associated with Summer's case. But that Candace did seem to be hiding something, not necessarily that she did something to Summer or that she knows where she is, but maybe she knows someone that she thinks could have been a potential harm or threat to Summer and she remained to let her daughter around these people. There's also a neighbor by the name of Donald that lives across the street from the Wells family, and he was interviewed by a YouTube channel called Jonathan Lee Riches, a.k.a. JRL, and Donald is ex-law enforcement. When he's asked about his thoughts on the case, he, without a shadow of a doubt, bluntly just says that he believes in his heart that Candace and Don know exactly what happened to Summer and where she is now. One thing that I've always wondered about, and I'm sure if you followed this case, then you probably wondered the same thing. On the day that Summer went missing, Don Wells drove Candace's newer model red Subaru to work instead of his work truck that he typically drove to and from work. And since it's a newer model vehicle, there are tracking capabilities that an older vehicle wouldn't normally have. And it's something very similar to OnStar inside the vehicle, which tracks your GPS movements. So I'm sure the police have verified that Don was actually at work on June 15th, 2021. And I'm sure they've even checked his cell phone records and probably even found witnesses that saw him at work. Which I feel like kind of rules him out as a suspect or even an accessory to whatever happened. That's not to say that Don Wells did or didn't know that the plan was for Summer to go missing or if he was involved in some way, if there was a plan at all, if the parents were even involved. But Don has made several statements before saying that he has about seven alibis for the day that Summer went missing and that Candace has none, which seems like a super weird thing to say about your wife, especially when you're talking about your daughter that's been missing. There have been other claims made by Candace's frenemy, Allison, and her family that Candace would give Summer drugs and alcohol on more than one occasion that they know of. And they speculate that maybe Summer got a hold of Grandma's pain meds that she had gotten that day and thought that they were candy. And that just seems like a stretch to me. But if the twisted tea thing with Hunter and the making the three older boys lay on hot pavement claim is true, then this could very well be true too. We just don't have proof. There's another theory that's been floating around for a while that a disgruntled ex-employee of Don's named Dudley Ajan may have been the one responsible for Summer's disappearance. But in an interview that Dudley did, he said that Don talked about meth damn near every day, and Dudley thinks that Don was just trying to put a feel out on him to see if he was also a meth user. Dudley also claims that Don was supposed to pay him for the last job that he did. He was supposed to get $2,100 for the job, but he was only paid a portion of what he was owed, and Dudley was fired by Don on Monday, June 14th, just the day before Summer went missing. And you really can't research this case without hearing or seeing something about the red barrel in the yard at the Wells house or reading something or hearing something about the scream. As far as the barrel goes, there was another TikTok video that Candace posted on her account of Summer playing in puddles in the yard. She's twirling around, she's dancing, but in the background there's a red barrel that had been spray painted on the side of it that read for sale. After Summer went missing, of course, people went to Candace's social media accounts and picked apart every single thing about their lives. Now, the idea that Candace posted the video on TikTok as a way for her to advertise the fact that she was trying to sell Summer into child sex trafficking ring seemed pretty far-fetched to me until I did a little more digging into human trafficking in the U.S. and apparently this is actually a pretty normal way to advertise your child for sale, which is probably the scariest thing I've ever said. But, just like everything else in this case, we just don't have proof of this. And I said there were two things that you won't look into this case without finding. That's the barrel and the scream. So, let's talk about the scream. There was a woman that lived on the street across from Ben Hill Road where Candace and Don lived with their kids that said that she heard a gut-wrenching scream on the day that Summer went missing. This woman says that she isn't the only one that heard it, that both of her teenage kids heard it too. She says that they had been having some issues with people coming onto their property lately, so they were all on guard paying extra attention to their surroundings and what was going on. When they heard the scream, it stopped them dead in their tracks. She says that she saw a car pull into Candace and Don's driveway that rubbed her the wrong way, but she let it go and just assumed that they had visitors. She heard the car door slam, and a few short minutes later, they heard the scream. 
She said that this scream was almost animalistic, but that she knew it was not an animal. This was only about an hour and a half later when she would hear Candace yelling for Summer, and later when the police arrived, these same neighbors joined the search for Summer. Police say that they do not think this scream has anything to do with Summer's disappearance, even though this neighbor wholeheartedly believes that that scream was Summer. After Summer's disappearance, Child Protective Services removed the three older boys from Don and Candace's care, and both Don and Candace claimed that the boys were removed from their care because of social media hate and threats that were being directed at them and their families. Although it was later said by Allison, who is 14-year-old Hunter's mom, that they already had a case open that was active through Child Protective Services prior to Summer's disappearance. And while I was researching this case, I watched a few episodes of a YouTube channel called The Report Room, where the host talks about Summer's bedroom being in the basement and sleeping on just a mattress on the floor without a box spring, headboard, or footboard. And this really just hit me the wrong way because it is not a crime to be poor. They did make sure that their daughter had a bed, she had a room, she had clothes, she was fed, she was washed. There are pictures of Summer with a dirty face and stained clothes. And to that, I just want to say that those same kind of pictures are on my phone of my very own kids. They are kids. That's what they do. They get dirty. They ruin clothes. They create stains. They create messes. The videos of the inside of the house are cluttered and overrun with clothes, home cleaning supplies, toiletries, etc., not being a clean freak is not a crime. Just because they don't live the way that everybody else thinks is normal does not mean that they don't love and take care of their kids. I'm only saying this as a general blanketed statement because I think Candace is guilty as homemade sin. All the interviews that Don and Candace have done after people started badmouthing them for living below the poverty line, they've since started calling Summer's room the, quote, playroom. And... Possibly they did that just to shut people up about where Summer was sleeping. Sometime from the time that Candace did the interview with Chris Madonu and the time that they went on the Dr. Phil show together, both footages of the videos are completely different. In the Chris Madonu one, you can see the clutter, the dirty, the, I mean, whatever. On the Dr. Phil show, she has nicer toys, a nicer dresser, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And I've seen and read a lot of stuff, and a lot of people just assume that they spruce Summer's room up to make themselves look better. But I'm from a tiny country town, and I would be willing to bet my very last dollar that after Summer went missing, for a little while, people started donating newer and nicer things to the family for Summer to keep the hope alive that Summer would come back, and that she would be able to use all these newer, nicer things that they would have set up for her now. Some of these interview sleuths are looking way too into country living, and how fast a small town will come together to help somebody in need. Also, the little small weird ways that us country people try to give each other faith when somebody else starts to lose all hope. And that is the case of Summer Wells. Well, y'all, it's been fun. Let's do it again. Same time, same place, next Wednesday. I'll see y'all then. That's how my mama murdered a podcast.